Well, let me put it this way. Uh, there are perhaps 60,000 species of creatures that most people call wildlife. They're mostly vertebrates. Uh, the fishes, the amphibians, the reptiles, the mammals, uh, and uh, the birds. And um, when people talk about seeing nature, they usually mean they go out and they see um, the flora, and then they see and they look for usually the wildlife, the big, bigger, well-known animals. But there may be only 60 or so thousand in the whole world of these. There are overall 8 million species of organisms out there by estimate. Right now we have, uh, we've discovered and we have a scientific name for almost exactly 2 million species. Um, but and the rest, somewhere in the city of 6 to 8 million, are still undiscovered by science. And these include what I like to call the little things that run the earth. Um, the insects, the in other invertebrates, a swarm through all of the habitats of the world, and they really run the middle levels of the uh, ecosystems of the world, in the sea as well as on the land. And so I became aware of that fact early on. Uh, and because I focused on that, uh, I only have one functional eye, and I can't hear very well in the upper um, registers. And what I did was, uh, but I have sharp vision in this eye, so I took insects as my main uh, subject of interest early on as a, as a boy, and uh, soon discovered that I had a whole world almost to myself to, just, to explore and discover. And that continued when I got to college, uh, that I was working on organisms that nobody else was paying any attention to, and I was making wonderful discoveries easily from year to year, and I still use that personal experience to recommend to young scientists that they pick a group of organisms or a kind of phenomenon uh, in these little known organisms to study. And they will have much greater chance of uh, real success in discovery and scientific endeavor uh, as a result <clears throat> than they would by taking a more traditional path. And, and that has held me transfixed ever since. And I still go on expeditions. I still Fantastic. Do. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, well, we, I, I did promise we can't, it can't be all biographical this evening, so I do want to talk about, um, about your book, um, which is fascinating and, and a wonderful read. Um, one of the things that, uh, that you talk about uh, in your book and that um, you know, certainly I've, I've come up against in, in the practice of medicine is that humanity's modern lifestyle has outpaced um, or somehow come to be at odds with the physiology that we've gotten through, through evolution um, and use the example of evolution not having enough time to cope with, you know, our, our modern diets and our sedentary lifestyle and, and that sort of thing. Um, but I'm, I'm curious, with your focus being on um, the social aspects of humanity, if you think that the rapid advance of um, information and communication technology and social media and, and that sort of thing has created maybe a, a similar disconnect um, between how we socialize and how we live our lives now with the social mechanisms that we acquired through evolution? And, and what implications mm -hmm. do you think that has for, for how we might interact going forward in, in the new modern age? Yeah, the discrony, you might call it, has resulted in uh, something far more important and dangerous than uh, stomach aches and, uh, and uh, early heart attack. And that is the fact that we, um, we're still basically paleolithic in our, our minds and the way our brains are constructed and our instinctive patterns. Um, I would call our species dysfunctional. Uh, because, one, uh, we have paleolithic emotions. I don't think they've changed. As the early Homo sapiens of 200,000 years ago, we have paleolithic emotions, we have medieval institutions that we still depend on, and we have godlike power. 
Now that is a very dangerous and unstable combination. And that's what, uh, where we are now as a species. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, he, didn't, he didn't say expatiate, please. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, so one of the other areas that I, I wanted to, um, to touch on, um, you, you talk a, a fair bit about religion uh, in your book and have talked about it in your past work. Um, and I, I think it would probably be fair to say that um, your book would leave one with the impression that you're not terribly fond of religion as a source of meaning for humanity. Um, otherwise, you probably wouldn't have lit, written a book called The Meaning of Human Existence. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering um, if, you know, you don't think that uh, religion necessarily gives us that sense of meaning and, and that we might have outgrown sort of the cohesion and the tribal aspects of religion that made it um, so evolutionarily adventitious. Um, do you think of it as anything to offer in the modern era, or do you think we're best leaving it behind entirely? Well, of course it does. Uh, actually, the main argument that I make uh, is that I think it's very natural for human beings to wonder about that just beyond our reach. And this whole uh, perception of eternity and space and time and um, I believe that human beings universally uh, share, have a strong tendency to share what might be called uh, religion in the theological sense. Uh, the, uh, the yearnings, the feelings about <clears throat> uh, the possible existence of God, of a supreme designer and maker of the world and the universe. Uh, we care about that a lot, and it's something important for the development of the human psyche. And we care a lot about whether there's a world beyond. Uh, I mean, that comes in constantly, uh, that there, we will be going to some other existence after death. It's very natural, it's universal, and it, that binds people together, actually, as uh, that kind of searching in the theological sense. What does not bind us together are the organized religions, what we call faith. And what is faith? Faith is the belief of a group, usually tightly organized by unquestioning uh, belief in it of uh, a creation story and of accounts of supernatural events. And each faith has, and there are hundreds of them around the world, and beyond that, many more in the history of humanity. Each faith has its own creation story, and it has its own stories of paranormal, actually, or supernatural events that occurred. <clears throat> and that's how it identifies itself as a faith. But that's not what really binds it together. What binds it together is the most powerful instinct, possibly, uh, of the social existence of human beings. And that's to form groups and to belong to groups, uh, to identify your personal self and your, your, your future with that group, and to submit in a way, in, in the religious realm, uh, to uh, the uh, details. Of the, cre of the creation myth and the paranormal. And that defines you, and it gives you meaning. And that's what has, I think, given its enduring power. And it, especially so uh, in the United States where people are tend, tend to join faith uh, according to accident or according to their liking or propensity. Um, but uh, beyond that, what is being expressed is tribalism, the need to belong to a group uh, and identify yourself with it and depend upon it for all of your needs, your psychological needs, uh, your, the expression of your strongest propensity to cooperate and belong. Uh, the problem is that um, different faiths compete. And no matter how gentle, this is the argument developed. I'm not declaring this as some kind of dogma by any means, but the argument goes that um, the, no matter how 
gentle, no matter how charitable, no matter how uh, tolerant members of particular faith are, they adhere to it, they, def they uh, submit to it, and they think of it and their group as superior to that of all other faiths. They have to, otherwise they would move from faith to faith. And which social psychologists have shown how this powerful insect manifests itself from early childhood on, and that when groups are formed experimentally uh, just for the purpose of testing it, and those who participate know that it's uh, just an experiment, uh, they quickly, when they form up the groups, or have the groups formed, they quickly, and they compete in some games or whatever, they quickly come to believe the other group is rather alien and, uh, you know, not quite up to uh, their level and uh, that they, their group is superior. This is highly adaptive in a Darwinian sense to believe in a group and to place your future, your life, and your probability of having offspring uh, within the circuit of the tribe and religion, faith, religious faith, then it's interpreted as a form of tribalism. And I would put it in a very strong manner by saying that <clears throat> faith has, faith, plural, have hijacked religion. Mm. So with, with that in mind, just sort of the, um, the strong tribalism component of, of religion, um, one of the other themes that you mentioned in your book is this competition between individual and, and group selection where traits of an individual, um, like extreme competition, might make them thrive within a group, but overall a group of extremely competitive folks you know, might, might do worse. Um, and I, I got the sense that that struggle between altruism and competition um, is one of the things at the, at the center of, of our existence as, as humans. And it seems to me that most of the effort in trying to reckon that, uh, sort of our moral discussion has been uh, centered, in, centered in religion, in the study of religion, and, and conducted in religious language. With religion so steeped in tribalism and, and things that are maybe outmoded, do you think that it can still serve as a place to discuss those moral issues that are, that are pressing? Um, or do you think we need to, to move past that and, and have a new forum that's not as, um, that's not as strongly, strongly steeped in the, the tribal competition? Uh, well, I think the, the, um, the major goal of uh, philosophy, maybe religion as well, in the future is self-understanding. And you just touched on an area where uh, science and humanities uh, could actually come together in a very meaningful way. That's very much on the minds of a lot of scholars, is how we can bring uh, science and the humanities together. Um, and what do we mean by self-understanding? And that's why uh, I use the word meaning. Uh, meaning, in this case, uh, is to the um, to understand the meaning is to go past history, uh, which began really about the origin, about the time of the origin of literacy, to go past it and on into prehistory. Uh, into the lives and the activities and the development of intelligence and emotion of the species that gave rise to the modern human species. And then to go beyond that into the actual evolutionary processes, which are biological, that drove uh, the uh, origin of human, the human species. And, uh, the way um, I like to put that is to say that history means nothing without prehistory, without understanding where our species came from in the near time of the last two million years. And prehistory means nothing without biology. We have to, in order to understand the human species, to understand ourselves, is to know something about those three great periods in the origin of humanity. And when you start looking into that then, you raise the question of where altruism comes from. Where does the religious impulse come from? 
why are we this particular way and not some other way in our instinctive, uh, in our brain architecture and our instinctive behavior? Um, and I'm, I, I, I run risking um, going a little afield here, but let me just no say. No problems with that. <laughs> okay. Uh, but one of the things I've done in uh, studies of social behavior and all kinds of organisms is to search for the known cases of social behavior in all kinds of organisms, particularly animals, and especially terrestrial animals, uh, that have developed uh, highly advanced societies, not societies that are organized by intelligence. Humans have that ability, you know, reasoning uh, and intelligent planning. Uh, but those organized by a division of labor. Is, there are individuals that reproduce more and thereby contribute personally more to another group who uh, are able to reproduce. And that this is part of a, um, a cooperative uh, structure, a society that allows caste formation, division of labor, and a highly effective operating unit, the group. And this capacity, uh, we call it U-social, E-U-social, uh, has, uh, to the best I can find, and others looking for it, has occurred in just 20 lines of evolving species in all the history of life, uh, tw uh, 20 times. Conspicuously in the social insects, for example, conspicuously in human beings. And then the other thing that emerged is quite peculiar. In every one of those lines, uh, the uh, division of labor and thus the beginning of highly organized societies was preceded by a um, particular adaptation the line went through, one or two species went through, and that is a female or a female and a male build a nest which they protect. <clears throat> they lay the eggs, the female or the male go out and forage for food and bring it in and raise the young to maturity. That's a rather rare condition that you find, instinct driven uh, in the animal kingdom. Rose 20 times and it's very rare. And most of those who've managed to pass to that level and pass over the threshold, and now in which the young stay with the parents, and now you have a eusocial society, uh, they generally are extremely successful. The dominant creatures of Earth among big animals are humans, and the dominant creatures of the Earth among the small creatures are the social insects, ants, termites, bees, wasps. So that explains part of it. But then, what's going on? I mean, how does it happen uh, that groups can form like that uh, and uh, actually divide labor and be cooperative and be altruistic? Because that's the key questions when we start asking the meaning of humanity. What, what made us like that? And the answer, uh, and here I've just emerged from a controversy, but I have on my side uh, some mathematicians of very considerable ability and a growing group of younger scholars. It is not, as it used to be thought, that kin come together. Kin helping kin makes it possible for to, to be altruistic, providing they have some degree of kinship with you and that that's the starting point for advanced society. That's been the dogma, or the dogma for almost 50 years. Uh, now we've overthrown that by showing that's mathematically impossible. You can't organize and evolve a system like that. And no demonstration of it has ever been made with any kind of a measurement. Uh, the correct answer is... Oh dear. <laughs> is what we call, forgive the technicality of this, and yet this is what the sort of thing that ought to be argued about and talked about in high school. 
uh, is multi-level selection. <clears throat> that is to say, you have groups. They're formed. Within the groups, individuals are competing. Uh, that doesn't mean, you know, they're all having wrestling matches. It's just that uh, some, uh, with some genetic combination, you're more likely to survive to adulthood. You're likely to have healthy children who survive. That's Darwinian. Uh, and their individuals are competing within a group. Between groups, on the other hand, uh, the, uh, you're having whole ensembles of individuals competing with other whole ensembles of individuals. That's group selection. And uh, the result of this is that there is a um, opposition of selection pressure, which are intuitively familiar to all of you. And we use the mantra, the following mantra, within groups, where individual, you know, individual level selection is called, where individuals are competing. Within groups, selfish individuals beat altruistic individuals. When it's competition between groups, altruistic groups, groups of altruists, beat groups of selfish individuals. So uh, social traits evolve by group selection and um, the two they are constantly evolving to create the, the totality of the social behavior and all the, all the instincts that organize it. And yet, it's an unstable combination. And uh, we're constantly driven from one toward one extreme or toward the other, back and forth. And it cannot ever settle down and be stable. And we've come, we have a word for that that's called conscience, the conscience. And it is a source of so much of our creativity in the creative arts, our stories, uh, much of our art, our music, uh, our jurisprudence deals with the conflict of these two impulses that created us. And that's the explanation uh, that I think is emerging from biology and, and I wanted to, I'm, I'm glad you brought up that, that struggle and how that informs the humanities because I, I wanted to ask, um, you know, certainly in addition to having this, this knowledge of prehistory, what other ways do you think science can inform the humanities to, to better explore existence um, besides just knowing, knowing our past and knowing the roots of that struggle that produces such beautiful art? We have just begun, I think, to find ways uh, to bring uh, whole areas of science now in contact with the humanities in very creative and positive ways. In terms of the origin of humanity, um, the, um, we should, we, we should, I think we should understand that if you're going to deal with prehistory, see, the humanities deals with history mostly, but if you're going to deal with prehistory, or where we all came from and so on, uh, then you're going to be having to deal with a lot of biology of the kind I just spoke of, and yet that's not so hard to understand once you start thinking it through. Uh, but the sciences generally, science generally is going to impact the humanities, or how shall I say, form synergistically unions with the humanities. Because science needs to study what's in the humanities, just as the humanities need to know what the foundation of aesthetic sense and artistic impulses biologically and why it is thus and so and not some other. Uh, it's not, cannot be done by all scientists. Never ask an astrophysicist about the meaning of human. <laughs> they, you know, they, they may try to answer it and you are respectful, but they have no chance to do it. Never ask an astronomer, never ask a chemist, never ask the majority of psychologists we never uh, ask even my colleagues in molecular biology. They're too far removed from the subject of interest. Who do you ask? And here I'll sound like I'm being dogmatic, but I'll defend it at EB. You ask the following evolutionary biologists. They're the ones that study the genetic history of whole lines of species that go from one kind of life to another. Ask uh, the paleontologists segueing to uh, uh, the uh, archaeology. Because in different time scales, 
Uh, they know what's happening in the origin of culture and adaptation to a particular environment, and also they know the fine details of things like uh, cranial capacity and from bone analysis and on what has been eaten uh, by our ancestors 100,000 years ago or a million years ago, and then ask the brain sciences. This is the, this is the big thing now. Uh, is the immense amounts of money being put into neurobiology to study how the brain works. And I believe that that, of course, is with the grail is the understanding the nature of consciousness. Uh, that's front page news mm -hmm. as it develops. And so ask the brain scientists and neurobiologists uh, about what the meaning of humanity is because they, they zoom in, uh, zero in on the centers of the subconscious mind and and the, um, and the conscious mind, the nature of mind, then they're going to have a lot to contribute to self-understanding of humans. But then now let's go to technology. Uh, ask the, um, those working on artificial intelligence and ask those working on robotics. That's where uh, we actually will carry on, are carrying on something like experimental and theoretical work on how a brain might work. Because these folks, and I just met with some of the, a team of the best ones just to talk about some of these issues, these folks are very ambitious. They're not just trying to produce supercomputers uh, and uh, a robot that remembers what you want for breakfast. Uh, they are uh, zeroing in on what are called the uh, robot avatars. That is, robots constructed to think and act like a human being, not because we want to open the possibility of, of allowing robots to replace human beings, but also by creating models of the brain and uh, decision making and so on in robots, we can uh, find out more and more about how we do it. So it's that sector, I've gone on a long time, but this is important. Certainly. And uh, <laughs> the, uh, you know, so, Ask those experts, and that's, they're the ones that are producing the answer of what is the meaning of human existence. So I, Andy's uh, given me the, the heads up that I have time for just one more question before we throw it out to the audience. Um, and I'm glad that um, you brought up uh, astrophysicists and, and folks who deal on a, a cosmic scale, because um, in, in one of the more widely cited passages of, of your book, um, you, you sort of put the earth and humanity into perspective, and I'll, I'll read this, this quotation out. Um, you say that earth relates to the universe as the second segment of the left antenna of an aphid sitting on a flower petal in a garden in Teaneck, New Jersey, for a few hours this afternoon. Now, we could spend a lot of time on why it's New Jersey versus um. Connecticut or, or what have you. Um, but I, I was curious, you also, in, in your book, you know, make a, a case that we have a unique role as sort of the mind of the planet, of the, the guardians of, of the, the bounty of biodiversity that we have. But if in the grand scheme of things, and if in, um, you know, the, on the cosmic scale, we're, we're a speck of sand on the beach, why does it matter if we get any of this right? What, is, what matter? Why, why does it matter if we get any of this right, if we, if we understand our meaning, if we, we act as the, the mind of the planet? Well, for one thing, we're wiping out cheerfully wiping out uh, the, uh, the other eight million species out there. Uh, most of them we don't even know yet. We know two million species roughly and very little about any one of them. And there's six million we estimate that haven't even been discovered yet. And these create, this is the biosphere, you know, that razor thin layer of living organisms around this little planet that creates the conditions within the biosphere necessary for the life of those millions of species, including us. And what happened was that we didn't just be created and then having the right atmosphere and the right amount of fresh water and, and, so, and temperature regimes and so on. No, they were always there. We evolved as a species um, over particularly the last six million years uh, to be exquisitely adapted to what's in that biosphere. And as we wipe out the biosphere, we're taking it on ourselves 
uh, to be super engineers in the future, to handle the levers and push the keys and take all the measurements to keep what was maintained automatically by the biosphere previously. Uh, we have to maintain it now ourselves with immense uh, expenditures of en energy. And that's a crazy way to go. That's why we should, uh, we should have as part of the overall environment movement, not just attention to climate change and pollution and so on, it should be devoted to the living environment because that was then, if I might quote myself again. <laughs> um, and I have a, I have a, little, uh, a little rule, and it goes like this. Uh, if you uh, save the living environment, those other eight million species, uh, then you will also automatically save the physical environment, which is what our mind is on now. Because in order to save the eight million species, we have to stabilize and return to some degree of previous normalcy the physical environment. We understand that, but we don't really understand uh, that we were going to have to do that in order to save the living environment. However, if you save only the living, and I mean the non-living, the physical environment, you'll lose them both because you've taken away the foundation, the means of existing of the other eight million species, and you've taken away the biospheric shield in which we lead, live. So understanding our, our place in the universe and how we came to get there isn't, I guess, just a matter of, of resolving this internal conflict we have. It's a matter of survival. We do, and I, I, I'm inclined to think uh, this is getting... Uh, this is getting, I guess, too blue sky, or even for my late, late, latest excursion. But um, we really do have to start thinking of ways of making our moral reasoning, moral reasoning transcendent. For example, I mentioned the theological forms of wonderment and belief in deity and so on, or ex, you know, the holding of this and the thinking of it. Uh, is transcendent, meaning it's shared by everyone. Somehow we've got to make the population of the world more like one tribe, mm. and then turn to what you might call, by definition, if it's one tribe and there's no competing faith, uh, to muck the whole thing up. If you develop it one tribe, then you have uh, you will have transcendent moral values, and we have some. But one transcendent moral value uh, is to save the living world, to save those eight million species. And I'm going to borrow, I know you're a doctor, I'm going to borrow uh, <laughs> a, uh, a rule uh, from medicine, from, doctor, uh, from the medical practice, uh, to apply to this very important part of our lives. And this rule is, do no further harm to the biosphere. Stop. Right now. <laughs> thank you. Good. Well, th thank you very much, Dr. Wilson. So we, we have some time for audience questions. Um, so the sort of works as, as it usually does here. We'll have uh, some folks on the aisles. Um, if you just hold off on your, uh, your questions until you get the microphone. Um, so we've got a gentleman over here on the, the right-hand side. I'll make it you to repeat. Good evening, Professor. I have, I have uh, two, two quick questions. Uh, the first question, what do you think of the invalidity of the mathematics of archaeopology uh, and, uh, and paleontology? Because in, 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 in abstract mathematics, when you calculate the domain of an equation, we calculate it mathematically. But in experimental science, when, you when we calculate the domain of an equation, we calculate it, we, we determine the domain of an equation according to the experiment. So that, my, that is my first question. So, so, so is that uh, can second? we go to the first question and answer and talk about that right now? Okay. Wait a minute. Repeat. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm a little. So hard I will. Here. I, I will try my best. Um, but I, I just yeah. want to make sure that I get this right. So, um, <laughs> we'd like to comment on the um, the. Um, Mathematical invalidity of the study of paleontology. 
Here, here is the problem. Uh, you, you mentioned the division of uh, labor. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we apply the division of labor to the intellect. So pretty much here is the biologists are doing biology and mm -hmm. the mathematics, the mathematicians are doing mathematics. But, 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 but here, 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 exactly what I said. In, in, in abstract mathematics, we use, we could use, we determine the, the domain of an equation in a mathematic way. But in, in experimental science, actually, we, 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 the, the, the method of, determine, of determining the domain of a certain equation is supposed to be su subjected to the limitation of the experiment itself. May I give you an example? So, so how do we, un unfortunately, <laughs> I don't think we have, yeah. we have time, um, but right. a, um, how, how, we, how we, um, we marry that sort of abstractness of, of mathematics with the, the constraints of the real world. Well, that you just asked, how does mathematics serve uh, science? What is the role of mathematics in, in um, science? And, and in this area of biology, it's no different than from what it, what it is in physics or chemistry. Uh, mathematical analyses um, are, uh, provide the models that are testable for uh, measuring uh, age of deposits, for example, and of uh, the capability of organisms to survive under different environmental conditions. Uh, it's uh, empirical, we experiment with it, and uh, we also use mathematical models to simplify the process in abstraction and then uh, expand into areas of space and time uh, where uh, we, we can't do solid empirical work but we can test the mathematical model by any number of tests. And if the results of those tests intersect uh, in what was predicted of the trajectory, uh, such as molecular, uh, uh, molecular fission and decline, uh, then uh, gradually we build a, an understanding of the process uh, that we call science. All right, go for another question. Right here. Making an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the features of human society is language. And I wonder if you'd like to speculate on the origins of human language. Oh, languages, you're saying. Language, yes. Yes. Um, that, that is an area that's not been really studied in any great detail uh, in terms of um, its origin by evolutionary process. Uh, we still are not completely sure whether species as distant as our direct ancestor, Homo erectus, and also our first cousins of the Neanderthals really had language. But I'm, I'm pretty sure, I, I just have a feeling they probably did have proto-languages. And it's, uh, it's, in order to have a language, uh, you have to have a vocabulary. That is what you call a real language. You have to have a vocabulary. It's flexible, and you need to be able to select objects and name them, you know, with a sound, particularly, since we are an audio-visual species one of the uh, group, one of the very few in the world, most species in the world are pheromonal uh, and are being audio, visual incidentally, uh, it makes it possible to have a language. We, if we weren't audio and visual, we couldn't evolve a language. But I, I, we don't know what the intermediate steps were, uh, but we think we can see what it would be in a very primitive form. We know that one of the most powerful instinctive drives, propensities to learn parts of human nature is that of children to learn language, as you know. I mean, this is as impulsive in a child as it is to form groups. And um, so that's not a very satisfactory answer, but... Uh, <laughs> but On the other a, hand, that we may have... It is a subject that we should be, uh, <laughs> yeah. the scientist, I hope, We'll be addressing much more carefully. We may have hopefully inspired a young scientist in the audience to take it up, and we can 
discuss it later on the stage. Yeah. All right, we have another uh, another question over here. Uh, gentleman uh, back on the, the left there. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Wilson, um, when you talk about one tribe, uh, and then I think you also say that it that it comes down to self understanding. And so self-understanding is something that has to happen like one individual at a time. And so how does that happen in, in a, uh, when you have within the group or a society such as here in the United States where, uh, you know, the, the, the selfish win? I, I know, yeah, precisely. Now, uh, we're, we, we're using self-understanding at two levels. You're speaking about the usual intuitive self-understanding of the individual who comes more and more to uh, recognize and analyze and know why he or she feels the way they, they do. Uh, and what I was talking about was something quite different, and that's... Uh, the species self-understanding. That means just as an individual needs to know when and where they were born and what their parents were like and uh, what big events occurred through them through their lives that make them react and feel certain ways, that's what you're referring to, um, then in a much broader space-time level, the, our species, Homo sapiens, should understand where we came from the real and why and what happened. The real questions to be answered uh, for self-understanding of humanity are the three basic questions, I suggest, of philosophy and religion. And they are, where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? And I think we are pretty close to answering where we, did we come from. We're beginning to approach, particularly we can do it the sooner we bring science and humanities together in a meaningful way, uh, we're, uh, we're uh, going to achieve what we uh, know what we are. And then we'll have a much better chance of deciding where we're going without committing species suicide. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, straight back in the, in the center. There have been a number of groups lately who have claimed that the development of artificial intelligence will prove to be the greatest disaster for humanity. What is your thinking on that score? Well, we've already created artificial intelligence. Uh, what would be um, an amazing achievement, and we know we're close to that, is something else. And that's what uh, the artificial intelligence people who are mainly interested in practical uses of, of improving artificial intelligence. But the, uh, the grail, uh, as defined within artificial intelligence robotics, is that we know we're near it, and that's, there's a name for it. Uh, it's whole brain emulation. And that is uh, the goal of um, all these people that are thinking far ahead in developing artificial intelligence robotics. That is, uh, to actually create a robotic brain that operates like the, uh, the human brain closely. And you emulate the human brain, but you're not duplicating the human brain, but you come close to putting in all the functions that a human brain has. Uh, and it's there, of course, where we can eliminate any real risk that robots could misbehave or multiply themselves and so on. Uh, uh, but there's actually a, uh, a controversy going among those who are working on whole brain emulation and, and advanced artificial uh, intelligence. And that is as to whether the uh, brain uh, is truly binary, binary digital, or whether it operates more as an analog computer. 
uh, and I won't go into the details because I'm not sure I understand them myself uh, very well. But the point is, uh, that's going. Uh, there are two strains of thought going into the dr uh, direction of create of uh, whole brain emulation, and one of them is analog. A belief, a belief, the human brain is very different from any digital device we create because it does operate in an analog fashion with masses of cells working together almost like masses of people uh, to bring the brain to perception and, and, and uh, decision making. All right, uh, one more further back this time but still in, the, still in the center. Just keep your hand up there, sir. There we go. Okay. Uh, while I find the idea of a unity of the humanities and science is very appealing, I can't help but wonder, even if we had a complete description of human evolution and an understanding of the source of consciousness, would that really inform moral philosophy? How would that tell us anything about moral reasoning, which seems to be in an entirely different sphere? You mean, uh, how can we further develop moral philosophy? Is that the question? using modern technology? My question is, is whether, even knowing everything about human evolution and the source of consciousness, how would that inform, or how would that form the basis for moral reasoning? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't quite get those so I guess, So, make sure I, I have this phrase correctly. So, knowing the um, evolutionary antecedents of sort of why we came to, to think the way we do and why we came to, to be uh, the way we are, how would that inform help us inform making decisions or exploring how we should best relate to one another? Is that How would it provide the basis for moral reasoning at all? What for moral reasoning, yeah, I didn't get that far in the dis discussion uh, to, uh, to tell you why it matters, these scientific studies, because I've just explained the origin of, of uh, internal conflict, you know, and, con and, the, uh, and the operation of what we commonly call conscience which is based upon innate feelings uh, that are essentially moral in nature. Uh, we know uh, increasingly well, um, or we think we know, and certainly we're in the earliest stages of this kind of research, uh, that in, there is such a, uh, a thing as innate moral uh, impulses. Jonathan Haidt at the University of Virginia has taken this line of reasoning as well recently. Um, and that is uh, created by group selection. If you have group selection operating, of, uh, which gives a, puts a premium on cooperation and uh, the um, exercise of the better angels, as we call them, of human nature within the group, which is what group selection produces, uh, then uh, there is no limit. Uh, to what uh, kind and degree of moral uh, reasoning and behavior that can be developed genetically, but it requires group selection. And, and so, keep in mind, we are a very peculiar species. We're brand new. Uh, we're a very new species. Uh, we're in the earliest stages of our evolution. We can't even understand ourselves yet as to where we came from uh, fully or what we are, and that we, um, uh, we should make, uh, that as a scientist, as scholars, people who are interested, uh, even the think tanks in Washington and on the op-ed page of the New York Times should start thinking seriously about the real problems uh, which uh, deal with um, those domains where the science and the humanities come together. Or we have try uh, one more there. We have time for one last question. Uh, gentleman up front here, you've had your hand up for a bit. Thank you. Dr. Wilson, I've heard you speak about the biological probabilities of extraterrestrial life and intelligent life elsewhere. Would those intelligent creatures elsewhere have a creation story? <laughs> Must we have one? You know, I'm in a, I think that's a great question. So was the, uh, does E.T., is E.T. moral? <laughs> uh, does E.T. Uh, have creation stories? Does it have 
proponents of um, different uh, religious faith tribes uh, killing one another for territory. Um, yeah, in the, in the early in the early stages of their evolution, before they finally woke up and and saw what they were doing, um, I think they would. I, I, because every line of um, the origin of advanced social behavior in the fairly brainless social insects and also in humans uh, suggests that we, uh, no, no, and the brainy humans, yeah, the brainless humans, okay, um, that uh, suggests that um, every one of those went through the same sequence of events to get a highly evolved social system. And I think the, the principles are so basic you know, like having to have a genetic code uh, to create a uh, protein system of reproduction um, is so consistent that I think we would expect to see uh, see it occurring on other planets where uh, where life evolved. But that you know speculation, but I think so. I, I don't think uh, they would want to kill us if they ever landed here. I don't think they'll ever want to land here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, even if they wanted to land here. Uh, here's something to, to think about, uh, and maybe you know, saying don't you know, stop worrying about ET or about UFOs. Uh, even if they wanted to land here, they couldn't. Not themselves, robots, yes, but not themselves, uh, because the result would be a biological train wreck. They're just two different uh, systems. H.G. Wells got it right. The bacteria did them then, and uh, I've even thought, you know, in my writings of honoring the man and calling it the Wells effect. <laughs> uh, in order, the Wells effect is in order to inhabit another habitable planet, uh, it is first necessary to eliminate all life on it down to the last microbe. And when you've totally sterilized it, then you can bring yourself and your uh, domestic uh, flora and fauna with you. Well, fortunately, now we've got Google Earth, so they don't even have to leave home to uh to have a look around. Um, thank, thank you all very much. Um, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Wilson. We'll have, um, we'll have a, uh, a, a book signing uh, up in the main lobby. Thank you very much. Yeah.